This evening, we are welcoming back uh, one of my favorite authors. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and say that um, because it is true, and then I'll tell you why. To get out all of his awards and what he, he has done, we'll do that quickly. He is the author of three books of poetry, Eureka Mill, Among the Believers in Raising the Dead, and two collections of short stories until this evening, and then it is three. Um, those two were Night of the New Jesus, uh, Night of the New Jesus Fell to Earth and the Casualties, and three novels, uh, One Foot in Eden, Saints in the River, and The World Made Straight, for which he was here last year to talk about. Uh, he is the Paris Distinguished Professor of Apostolic Studies at Western Carolina University, and he has received the Appalachian Writers Association Book of the Year Award and Ford Magazine's Gold Medal for the Best Literary Novel, both in 2002 for One Foot in Eden. Uh, he is here tonight to talk about his new collection. And I think what Ron Rash does best, uh, speaking as a, another boy from the hills and the hollers, is that Ron Rash captures Appalachia probably better than anyone else. And um, coming from a completely mountainous state like I did, you read a lot about Appalachia, and you read a lot about your home state. And you know, I've read Denise Giardina and, and, and other authors, but uh, what's beautiful about Ron is that there's a mystique and there is a meaning in what he writes. And you can smell the moisture that's in the valleys, and you can hear the babbling brooks and it brings back home. So we are pleased to welcome back to the home of the Georgia Center for the Book to talk about his new collection, Mr. Ron Rash. Well, that was a great introduction, and it means a lot to me. And it's great to be back here. Uh, this is actually my last stop. I've been doing a tour I was in Los Angeles, New York, so it's kind of nice to be back uh, a little closer to home. And what I wanted to do tonight, uh, I am going to read uh, from my new story collection, Chemistry. But one of those stories, the longest story, uh, which is called Pemberton's Bride, is, is a story that actually has be, is, is a part of a, a novel that I've just, just finished, uh, actually just sold a couple of weeks ago, uh, both in the United States and in France. And I was very happy about that, though I can't imagine how they're going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, get this Appalachian dialect <laughs> and, and uh, translate it. But uh, that's their problem, not mine. Um, but... I'm going to read, actually part of this will be actually from the story, but also I'm going to put in some parts from the novel as well. So you'll get a little bit of both tonight. And uh, uh, the story is called Pemberton's Bride in the book, but uh, the title of the novel is going to be Serena. And uh, just to give you a little bit of background before I start reading, uh, uh, Serena is, is a woman, this, this, the novel is set in 1930s, 19, actually 1930, in uh, Western North Carolina, up near uh, below Asheville, um, and it's set in a timber camp. And Serena Pemberton is a woman who has grown up in Colorado. Her uh, father was a timber man in Colorado, has taught her uh, about timber because she grew up in that camp. But she also, because her father was very wealthy, has been educated uh, by uh, tutors that he's brought to uh, Colorado. And um, uh, so she's very highly educated. Uh, her family has all been, all died in the 1918 uh, flu epidemic. She survived it. She's gone to Boston, left uh, Colorado behind, and met a man named Pemberton, who essentially owns a mountain county. Uh, he's a timber man as well, and they've met each other. And the novel actually, and the story, begin with uh, Pemberton and his bride coming to the North Carolina mountains. And they come into this world where um, Serena is almost the only woman in the camp. There are a couple of women in the kitchen, but that's about it. And Serena quickly uh, becomes something that none of the other men have seen anything like her before, none of these men, because she uh, dresses uh, not the way uh, they expect a woman to dress. Uh, she wears jodhpurs and, and, and pants. Uh, which causes great consternation, as you'll see. Um, she rides, uh, she doesn't ride side saddle. 
uh, and she becomes, in the course of the story and the novel, uh, almost a mythical being to these men. They, they, they see her as a kind of goddess. And um, in the scenes I'm going to read tonight, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that timber camp, and then I'm going to read some scenes where you see Serena. Actually, uh, her first test when she comes to the camp, uh, the first day she's introduced to the workers, uh, one of the workers spits when he when she says that you know when Pemberton introduces and says she knows as much about timber as you do, so she challenges that man to a test of a board feet of a tree nearby, and they cut it down, and and she wins that contest. Um, so that's kind of the start of her, and uh, they as you will see later in the story also they're having a problem with rattlesnakes biting the men, and nobody can figure out what to do. But Serena knows what to do, and you'll find out about that as well. But anyway, this is the first day after they've, they've, uh, they haven't cut down the tree yet, but they're getting ready to. Uh, Serena's made her guess as far as board length, and now she actually goes out with the men. So this is uh, as they go out to work. Serena rode out behind the cutting crews as they followed the train tracks toward the south face of Nolan Mountain passing through acres of stumps that from a distance resembled grave markers in a recently vacated battlefield. The workers soon left the main train line that went over the right side of the mountain and instead followed the spur. Their lunches in tote sacks and paper bags, and some in gallon milk pails, a couple in lunch boxes shaped like bread loaves. Some of the men wore bib overalls, others flannel shirts and pants. Most wore Chippewa boots and a few wore shoes of canvas or leather. The signal boys went barefoot. They passed the shade train engine the workers called a sidewinder and the coach car, then the six flat cars and the McGifford loader, and finally at the spurs end, the high lead skitter already hissing and smoking. The booms, long steel cables spooling off the drums and stretching a half mile upward to where the tail block looped around a massive hickory stump. From a distance, the boom resembled a huge rod and reel, the cables like cast lines. The boom angled toward the mountain, and the cables were so tall it looked as if the whole mountain was hooked and ready to be dragged down the tracks to Waynesville. Men followed the cables up the steep incline where they'd been cutting for two weeks, toward tools left hung in the forks of trees or hidden under leaves. Not just axes, but eight-foot cross-cut saws and steel wedges and blocks and pike poles and the nine-pound hammers called go-devils and the six-pound hammers called grab-skips. Some of these implements had initials burned in them, and some were given names as might be allowed a horse or rifle, and all but the newest had their handles worn smooth by flesh, much in the manner of sto stones smoothed by water. As the men made their way through the angled stumps and brush they called slash, their eyes considered where they stepped, for those snakes seldom stirred until the sun fell on the slopes. The yellow jackets and hornets offered no respite. Nor did the mountain itself, which could send a man tumbling, especially on a day such as this when rain made the ground slick and yielding to feet and grasping hands. Most of the workers were still exhausted from last week's six 11-hour shifts. Some